you very much for having me here. And, uh, and, um, and I wanted to start off by you know, looking, um, uh, telling you a little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know me, those who are not there, like who are not in Light Academy and at that time. So uh, my name is Albert, like I mentioned before, currently a final year researcher at Barcelona Sport Computing Center and a PhD candidate at uh, the Technical University of Catalonia, which is the University Politecnica de Catalonia. And um, like I mentioned before, I was in Light Academy uh, and I graduated in 2008. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was there in 2005 and 2008. That's when I did my KCSE, uh, left Light Academy right about that time. Now, two years later, I left Academy and went to Turkey where I joined Erges University to pursue a bachelor's degree in computer engineering. Um, and in the two years between 2008 and 2010, I was actually working at Light Academy. That was my first job ever. I was actually working like at Light Academy as what we call Abbeys back that time. Uh, what that meant was basically a supervisor and we were in charge of like um, students in the dorms and, and I was uh, specifically, I was in charge of the computer lab. So I got really interested in, in computer lab um, work and computing at that point. But my interest in computer started way earlier than that. And, and, and I remember when I got my scholarship to study in Turkey, Mr. Kuchuk, I don't know if he's around today, Mr. Ismail Kuchuk came, came, uh, came to me and told me, hey, we found a scholarship for you to go to Turkey and you're gonna study computer engineering. I didn't even have to choose what I was going to study. To study. They kind of just told me, hey, we found a scholarship for you to go to Turkey and you're gonna study computer engineering. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's perfectly it, right? Um, and, 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 uh, and to tell you a backstory of this is, is, is uh, in the two years that I was there, I kind of was trying to get, get all sorts of scholarship to, to go abroad and, and, and do my education abroad. And, and in 2010, that's when I got my scholarship and I went to Turkey, uh, spent five, uh, five years there actually. Because again, in 2000, between 20, 2015 and 2017, I moved to Abdullah University where I did my master's in computer engineering. Um, and then that's when I finally left Turkey. Seven years later, I left Turkey and went to Spain where I'm currently doing my PhD at um, the Barcelona for Computing Center. Uh, it's my final year. I'm hoping to graduate somewhere um, in May or June at most. So yeah, that's kind of like my timeline about that time and how, how we got, how I got here. Um, but a backstory a little bit about this is that, you know, when I was in second year uh, in, 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 in uh, that's like from high school, I, I basically what my up to, I kind of wanted to be a medical doctor, but you can clearly tell from this picture that well, that was a very invalid dream from the way I'm holding the stethoscope and everything. I probably clearly had no shot at a medical degree. So um, that's, that's how, I, but, but back, this was during one of the science fairs in Mombasa, and I was doing a test on blood pressure or something like that. I had a thing for biology and I was pretty good at it actually. Uh, Mr. Tumer was my biology teacher. So I, I was hoping that, you know, I would, I would be a medical doctor at some point, but yeah, uh, that didn't work. Nevertheless, I was determined to be a doctor, just not a medical one for that matter. And that's what I'm still doing. I'm not yet a doctor, hoping to be one very soon. Uh, but that dream kind of kept, and so I usually tell myself that you know I'm still going to be a doctor, just not a medical one, um, and, and I'm and I'm really excited about that actually. So um, this was the class of 2008, uh, uh, just uh, during our KCSE exams. Fantastic group of people, and uh, and uh, you know they were really. It was one of the best classes in the school, and and the best thing about this is that all these guys that you see here are right now doing extremely great stuff in very different parts of the world. Some of them we went together uh, to Turkey, uh, others went to Russia. I think Selvin is in Russia. Alamin was with me in Turkey, and then later I think he left for the U.S. Uh, um, Ahmed was also with me in Turkey. And then after that, I think he left for Tanzania or something. So a lot of these guys are in different parts of the country. Some of them are still in Kenya. Some of them are else, elsewhere outside doing great stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a really exciting group of people. Um, and, and, uh, and in this group of people, there was like the, the, the seven or eight of us that were doing computer science back in high school. So in, in form two, uh, we select the subjects we want to do. And uh, generally, you know, there's business or computers. And, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people obviously just choose business. Uh, I don't know why, but I chose computer science and computer I'm studies. I'm really excited to also note that a lot of this, I mean, almost everyone you see here is doing extremely great stuff in, in different fields. I think four or five of us went ahead and pursued computer science in university. Uh, Francis is doing some really good stuff with IoT. Uh, if you know what IoT is, it's like Internet of Things. He's doing some really good stuff, innovations around agriculture. So this is, this is a 
really group of uh, good group of people. Christopher Kirui is doing something in logistics. He also did a computer science degree. Steven, I think, ended up doing civil engineering, but he's doing great stuff as well. Ali Kamau, good to note that he's doing some great stuff teaching the next generation of computer scientists and mentoring them and that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, I cannot mention each and everyone. I think except for Andrew, pretty much everyone here went into technology or engineering. I think Andrew became a lawyer or something along those lines. So, um, and, and Adrian also went to, uh, to computer science. I'm not, I'm not sure where each and every person is right now, but um, this was a really good group of people. Now, we kind of look really malnourished from these photos here. Uh, and you would think, you know, that's kind of sad considering these guys are in one of the best schools in the country. And we, we, we had really good food in Light Academy, actually. One of the best things that we remember about Light Academy was the good food. Apart from the good education, they had good food. So, but uh, I think the malnourishment, malnourishment and, the, and the tired faces is from the number of hours we spent in the computer lab. We spent an incredible amount of hours in the computer lab trying to uh, work on our final year projects. And it was a very stressful moment. Anybody who has done computer science or computer studies in high school will tell you that you know, the final seven months when you get your project to work it out uh, is a really tough time. It's a really tough time. And so we spent a lot of time working on projects, you know, grinding, and uh, it was really good. Uh, and, and, and even though it was a very painful process, it was a really good process. And that kind of gave me the, 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 the I, I kind of got used to the idea of, you know, sitting down and working on code for really long hours, because that's pretty much what we were doing. And we were doing that um, in, 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 um, in high school. So, and, and I hope that, you know, Light Academy, because Light Academy was one of the very few schools in Kenya that offered like a really good computer science curriculum and computer science education. And it's from these that, you know, a lot of us were passionate about these things. We had some of the best computers um, in the lab, even though it was just a high school lab. Some people used to joke that we had better computers than um, universities even. But yeah, it was a really good school and we had a great time there. So that's a little bit about my story with Light Academy and how, uh, you know, things got there. And, and that's why today I'm coming back uh, as a former student, um, having graduated from this very computer science group, um, to talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence and, and, and what's what happening, because that's um, now working as a researcher at Barcelona's for Computing Center. And I work primarily on artificial intelligence and supercomputing and that kind of thing. And artificial intelligence is like uh, what we call the fourth industrial revolution. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this revolution so that we can kind of get a story of where we're coming from and where we're heading to and where we missed out and how we can make sure that we're not missing out in this industrial, I mean, in this next revolution. So that's basically the outline of today's talk. I want to talk a little bit about where we came from and how we have gotten to where we are. And what was our role when all the other revolutions were happening, like the first revolution, the second revolution, and third revolution, and now the fourth revolution is happening? Where were we and what was our role in that? And how comes we missed out on most of it? And how do we make not missing out on the next industrial revolution, which is currently happening as we speak? So that's basically the, the, the story of my talk today. Um, so the four industrial revolutions, as, as they're popularly known, is, you know, the first one was like mechanical uh, production. This is this, is, this era is marked by the invention of the steam engine. And you would think something so simple as a steam engine was, was such, is such, is such a trivial thing. But right before that, you know, there was the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire before that, and then, um, then humans invented steam and figured out that, you know, we can make things run with a steam engine. So what that meant was that we had a lot of development in terms of things that could be moved around with steam. So we had, for example, the railroads were built and steam power became a driver of the industries. And then somewhere around 1850s, um, again, we have another big revolution and that comes with the electrical power. So we finally get the grid, we can move our power around and that means we can run more machines with our power. So that significantly improved how we were doing manufacturing, how we were doing, you know, industry and that kind of thing. And it's around that time also that we figured out the idea of an assembly line. You would be surprised that, you know, right? I mean, before that we had, I mean, we could, we can make cars, but the concept of an assembly line was not really invented at that point. And I think it's the Japanese who kind of figured out that, hey, if one person did this part and another person did this part, and another person did that part, then we could create some sort of a pipeline and we could move things along the pipeline much faster. So electricity made that happen and everything changed after that. Then somewhere in the 1950s, uh, we have another uh, revolution. So remember we have had electricity being invented, but the electronics are not yet there because for electronics, we need silicon. 
And somewhere in the 1950s or early, 19, uh, early 1900s, we again have another um, um, industrial revolution. And this is where computers actually come in. We have a revolution that means now we can computerize things and that changed again, drastically changed everything. So that was the third revolution. And what this revolution came up with was electronics that we could use to uh, fly, to make computers that could communicate and that kind of thing. And it's at around that time, like, you know, late into after that time that man, uh, that people were finally able to go to the moon because we had kind of figured out the technology needed to do that kind of thing. Now, note that this is the technology. The mathematics of that had sort of been figured out earlier and it just took a little bit longer time for the technology to get there. So around 1950s, we have the third revolution. And again, everything changes drastically. If you look at the US economy at that time, things just start moving up. If you look at the global economy as well, things just start moving up. And then somewhere in the 2000s, people start talking about artificial intelligence and it becomes kind of a big thing, right? Everybody's talking about artificial intelligence, you know, big data, robotics. Actually, robotics kind of ended up becoming popular at, uh, at that point. I mean, before we had that were used in industry, but now they become more popular. Why? Because people figure out there's a lot of things we can do with robotics and there's a lot of um, interesting stuff that robotics can help us achieve. So right about that time is when we have the talk of the industrial, I mean, the fourth industrial revolution. And then people start talking about industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I put medicine in between the third revolution and the fourth revolution. And you will see why that is important as we move on. Because more than medicine, as it's known today, you know, the invention of MRIs, um, the first heart transplant, it takes place about 1960, 67 there in, in South Africa. And that's when we, we kind of had the tools that we needed to do modern medicine. The MRI machine is invented about that time also. And this kind of technology, which is, by the way, driven by the third industrial revolution, pushes medicine so forward that medicine becomes, you know, the medicine we know today. So if you look at medicine today, it's kind of like a fruit of the third industrial revolution. Like I'm talking about the medical machinery or the equipment that we have, not medicine as the practice, but the equipment that we use today in medicine. So that's why I put medicine there, because again, I'm going to show you how that wraps up with the fourth industrial revolution. So that's kind of the story of how these things have gotten there. That's how we have ended up being here. And now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. And as this, um, I got this quote from the, 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 the report that was written by the government of Kenya to, to talk about AI. And it says, we stand on the brink of, of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. Now, if we are in such an important point in history, we have to be part of this. We have to make sure we are part of this revolution that is happening. And if you look at this history that I've just taken you through, a lot of these things happen somewhere in the UK or in the US or that kind of thing. So now this is the fourth industrial revolution and we have to be part of this revolution. And this is why I'm giving this talk and this is why I'm really excited to talk about this talk today. So um, how did we get here? How did we get to the fourth industrial revolution? Like many things that we know about, especially in technology, they started with the war. So in the Second World War, um, uh, the Second World War broke out, Germany invaded Poland, things got messy, France and Britain decided, hey, we're gonna declare war on, on, um, on, on Germany. And right about that, I mean, after a few years, Japan also declares war on the US and the world gets into a mess. But in this mess, there is a lot of scientific innovation that is going on behind. And one of them that had actually been there was this tiny machine here called Enigma. The Enigma was such a fundamental element that it's today, you know, when we look at computer science, when we look at the history of computer science, we kind of trace a lot of things back to the Enigma. Why? Because at this point, the Germans were using this machine to transfer their codes uh, uh, and to, to say which points the, the, their, their U-boats were, and then they would attack the, the, the Allied forces, and, and the Allied forces were losing every battle. If you look at the earlier stages of the, of the, of the World War, the Germans were, were winning everything. They had this machine that they were using um, that was called Enigma. And how the Enigma worked, actually, it's a modern day password. It's a modern day encryption tool, right? You would key in some digits and then that would kind of code your message. And another Enigma machine in a ship somewhere or whatever, like, would interpret this message, would decode it and get to know what you were talking about. Now, it turns out if you could figure out how to crack this machine, then you would understand where the German boats would be. You would understand what the Germans were planning and how the whole thing was going on. But this was not an easy task. 
when Germany invaded Poland, the Polish people started figure, trying to work extremely hard. There was a bunch of brilliant Polish mathematicians that were working so hard to decode this machine and to decode the code that was going on in these machines. So, but they never really got successful uh, into decoding, but they did a major part of the initial work on that. Until this, uh, until sometimes uh, later this machine, when Poland was completely defeated, nothing could happen in Poland because Poland was overtaken in less than a month, I think, when the war started. So now things started happening in the UK. And it's this man here called Alan Turing that kind of now started, continued the work of decrypting the enigma. And if you've watched a movie called Animation Game, it's, it's an interesting movie, one of the best movies I've ever watched. Alan Turing tries to figure out how the enigma works. And he says that, you know, for us to be able to figure out how an enigma works, we cannot do this manually. We cannot do this mathematically. We need something, a general purpose machine that can look at all possible combinations and figure out what the decryption, I mean, how to decrypt these messages that the Germans are sending. And so Alan Turing gets to work with another bunch of mathematicians and finally they figure out how to decode this. And they create this machine called the Bombe. This is just a kind of like a modern recreation of it. And to be very honest, I personally think this is where computing started. The theoretical part of it had, done, had been done. Uh, the mathematics was already existing, but coming up with a general purpose machine to do this kind of thing was unheard of. So uh, Alan Turing builds this machine and things work so good. They finally managed to decode the machine. They finally managed to decode um, uh, the Enigma codes. And guess what? When they managed to do that, they were able to know where the German U-boats would be. They were able to know which roads to be avoided and whatever. And the Allied forces stopped losing uh, a lot of soldiers that they were losing in. And that is exactly how, I mean, that's finally how uh, German loses the war because the Allied forces now could decode all their messages. They would know where they were. And even though the process took longer because Alan Turing said, if, if we tell them that we have, if we, show, if we start attacking all their locations, they will know that we have decoded their machine. So he sort of kept it secret and it was a top secret in the UK, what was going on and if they had figured out how to decode the machine or not. So that kind of ended up being a secret, but later on uh, it's revealed, you know, that Alan Turing and his group had finally decoded this machine and Alan Turing laid the foundation of what is today called computer science. He was a mathematician who, you know, a lot of computer science people and uh, the computer science community honors as the, you know, the father of modern day computer science. But also when the war, so after that, the war ends, uh, you know, the allied forces win and everybody's good, Germany's divided, blah, 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 all that happens. But back in their respective countries, scientists continue working, right? They figure out uh, that, you know, there's more that we can do. Alan Turing has already suggested the idea of a general purpose machine, but also Alan Turing says, what if we can build computers that can think, right? And that's really, if you, if you try to think about it, that's kind of like where the whole idea of artificial intelligence comes in. He starts thinking, what, what if we can build computers that think? But then how do we define thinking? What is thinking? For example, are, are all humans capable of thinking? And if we were to define thinking, what would thinking look like, right? So Alan Turing writes a paper, uh, and that paper becomes kind of like the foundation of uh, 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 artificial intelligence. And in that paper, he suggests something called the Turing test. And he says that the ultimate test of, of, of knowing that a machine is intelligence is we need to do a simple Turing test. And how this Turing test is gonna work is that he suggests two things. We're gonna have a judge who is a betrayer, like a human. And in one room, we put a computer and in another room, we put a machine. Now, the idea is that if we, if we ask these two, the computer and the machine, the, 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 the arbitrator, the judge doesn't know who is a computer and who is a machine. But he says that if we give the same question and, and then the user, the, the, the the arbitrator or the judge cannot tell the difference between who is a machine and who is a robot, uh, I mean, who is a machine and who is human, then that has passed the intelligence test. And therefore, that is an intelligent machine. He writes that paper right before he dies and the paper is released. But here's the tricky thing about that. That's not an easy test. It looks simple, but not very easy test. If, if I ask, um, for example, um, a simple question to Siri today, let's assume I'm doing this test with Siri. On one end, I have the human, and on one end, I have Siri. I asked Siri, uh, that's kind of tricky, right? I cannot, Siri can go do a web search and tell me what's the answer. The human can also look outside and tell me what's the answer. So I read between the two. Um, but what if I ask, uh, um, ask another question, like, how was your day today, right? So they would not, I mean, you can't, like, as a human being, you can sort of be able to tell the difference, right? And that's easy. But then that kind of, that test kind of tells you which one is human and which one is, uh, 
uh, machine. But also, like the computer can be doing, I ask, what's the 50th root? I mean, what's number in pi? The computer will directly give me that answer, but the machine will not be able to give that answer. So this, this test was kind of a two-way test, and it was a really important test because um, it kind of set things into, into uh, uh, perspective. And people now started asking themselves, OK, so we need to think about artificial intelligence. This is kind of important. And that's what happens in the next couple of years. So in 1955, we have a conference that uh, was held in the UK, uh, led by John McCulloch. He was a computer scientist. And that's when the term artificial intelligence was first coined and used. It becomes known as artificial intelligence. And there's a lot of government funding to do that. Between 1960 and 1973, again, a lot of developments happened. We have ELISA, which was like kind of like the first uh, chatbot, what we call today Siri or, or uh, Amazon Echo. It was the kind of first, uh, you know, the really crooked version of it, but it was not, um, it didn't have audio. It was more of uh, text. And then we have the intelligent robot, which was kind of trying to be intelligent, it's called Wabot, trying to be intelligent, but not really there yet. But it's also around that time that we invented the idea of a perceptron, which was borrowed from neuroscience. And the perceptron was basically, if you look at a neuron uh, and how the neuron behaves, then we, we, can, we can sort of like build something similar in a computer. But remember at that point, we still don't understand very well how the human brain worked. So not much happens. So between 1974 and 1980, it's what is you know, you know, known as the sad times in, in, in AI, because really nothing happened. We call it the AI winter. Why? There was not a lot of government funding. Uh, we can do so much. Then people are like, um, no, actually the only thing we have been able to get so far is a thing that looks like a robot, but it's not working so well. So there was not a lot of government funding in that. But then between 1980s and 2000, uh, again, there's a generated interest in AI. And why this happened was because uh, um, somewhere there, the IBM Deep Blue, which was a very uh, powerful computer, managed to beat the, the, the chess champion at that particular point. Now, if you know how to play chess, then you know that chess is a really complicated game. And, you know, Alan Turing had tried to do it earlier, but it was so crooked that, you know, we could never get there. But then in 19... Uh, I think it was 19, I don't remember the exact year, but somewhere in the 1990s, IBM's Deep Blue Gym finally managed to beat a human in, that, uh, in the game of chess. And that changes everything. People get interested again in artificial intelligence, and there's a whole hype around it and that kind of thing. But also at that particular point, neuroscience is developing. Humans are starting, medical doctors and neuroscientists are starting to understand how the brain works. And so we get a lot of uh, new, renewed interest in, in neuroscience and kind of like based on understanding of how the brain works, we sort of start understanding how now we can build machines that can do what the brain does. And that, that's a really interesting time. And then now between 2005 and 2018, wow, a lot of things happened. Deep learning comes about, you know, combining so many layers of, of perceptron together, uh, um, and being able to do uh, you know, really powerful things that we thought was never gonna happen. ImageNet happens, which was like a competition to, to classify objects in an image. And somewhere along that line, a, a group from, um, uh, first of all, there was AlexNet, which was a group uh, from, I think it was in the UK at that particular point, that managed to solve better than any existing algorithm and achieved an accuracy of about 75%, trying to classify a thousand images into different classes. But then, Somewhere between these three years, I mean, between these years, we finally get accuracy that is better than the human accuracy. So computers have managed to beat humans in recognizing objects in an image. And that was big. So natural language processing develops. We have uh, Amazon Echo, Google um, um, Voice, and all these kind of things are super developing. You know, computers are able to do all this. Uh, and then we also have the driverless cars, you know. Uh, I like, um, Tesla is working on that. There's a, another group, Google, uh, group at Google that is doing that. And that is basically called the AI explosion. So there's a significant interest in this and things really change. Andrew NG starts calling, Andrew NG is an instructor and former professor at Stanford, starts calling AI the new electricity. Now, if you remember my story from before when electricity happened, things changed. And Andrew NG says, well, now that we have AI happening, this is the next phase. And this is why we are calling it the fourth industrial revolution. Because at that point, AI now starts gaining so much traction. Companies are talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. And it's kind of like a really, really big thing. But so that's basically how we have gotten here. Then in 2019, something really interesting happens. Joshua Bengio, Geoffrey Hinton, and Jan LeCun win the, the Turing Award. Now, 
If you don't know what the Turing Award is, it's the most prestigious award in computer science. Computer scientists call this the Nobel Prize of computer science. It's a huge deal. And I remember I was sitting in the office when they won this, and I was like, wow. So there is a huge talk around town of you know, AI and whatever, you know, New York Times is featuring them. And therefore, there's a renewed global interest again in, in, in AI. But remember, there were so many years that people were not even talking about AI. What was happening? But during all those years, underground, mathematicians and computer science were working so hard to get AI to where it is today. And in 2019, when these three finally won their Turing Award, people felt like this was a validation of, you know, the world, the governments, everybody is finally recognizing the power of AI, right? So this was a phenomenal moment. It was such a, like, for me, it was such an emotional moment even because, you know, it meant that, you know, guys, we're doing something, that we are actually doing something significant out here. So why now? Why did it take so long from, you know, from 1950s when uh, Turing suggests that, you know, we can kind of have an intelligent machine to now? Why has it taken so many years to get here? Well, somewhere in the 1960s, a guy called Moore, who was like uh, the CEO of Intel, said that every two years, the number of transistors in a machine is going to double. And when that happens, the power of the computer is going to get X, it's going to double. So he suggested that, you know, Every two years, we're gonna be able to pack more. Tra so transistors are the small units that kind of like the single most unit that we have in microchips that kind of enable us to do what we do, like, you know, the silicon technology. And this is every, and true to every, is just that this there, the number of transistors kept doubling, kept doubling, kept doubling. But something happened in that time. Uh, you can have so many transistors, but if we keep doubling the number of transistors, then we have to lower the voltage because the chips were heating up. So we couldn't anymore go beyond uh, that. And then people started saying, oh, most law is dead. That's it, we're done, blah, blah, blah. But really, you know, computer scientists are brilliant people. At that point, they figured out, what about instead of putting everything in one chip, well, we, we have two chips. And if you are alive at that point, then you will remember after Pentium 4, that is when we ha started having the dual core machines, right? If you remember around that time, that's when we started having the idea of dual core and core to dual, which meant that, you know, instead of a computer having just one chip, we could actually have two chips. And that again meant that, you know, Moslow was not actually dead. We could keep going, we could keep going. But how far can we go, right? Are we gonna create a computer that fits the room? That you don't have that much. I mean, you can, it's not logically possible to do that. So, at that point, G I mean, a, a year or two later, GPUs start featuring. Now, if you know anything about GPUs, it's not like they were a new thing. They were still there. Um, people who do gaming know about GPUs. They're very popular in gaming. But then we figured out we can actually use GPU to do compute. And guess what? We can even use GPUs to do machine learning. And that is when machine learning really took off. So the reason why machine learning didn't take off at that you know, from the early stages is we simply didn't have enough computing power to be able to compute the things we needed to compute. But at that point, with technology coming up so fast, we were finally, and if you look at ImageNet, the thing I was talking about earlier, the computer science, the, the, the computer machine learning application started winning right about this time, because then we had GPUs that could process this data and could sort of like, you know, figure out what's happening in the images and do the classification. So right about that time, GPUs come in. And even now in 2020, NVIDIA just released a new version of GPUs, super powerful. So things happen and we realize, you know, technology is not the limit anymore, right? Uh, hardware is gonna keep catching up. Hardware will definitely catch up. But that's not the only thing um, that happened, right? There was this other paper that was released by Google about 2009, there, somewhere there, it's called the Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. Now, this seems like a really weird name for a paper, but this paper was so important because what, what the guys at Google suggested was that even if we don't have a very, very strong algorithm, if we have enough data, then we can train this algorithm to be very accurate. And so, um, efforts started being driven to collecting more data. And remember, it's about this time that we have the data explosion. We're having so many, so much data. People have computers at home. Everybody has a mobile phone and whatever. We're generating so much data in terms of images and whatever. And therefore, these guys at Google say, look, if we have enough data, then we can be able to get the algorithms to work. So these two things kind of combined together and made artificial intelligence what it is today. The power of the computer just moving up and catching up and availability of so much data. And what that meant was we could train 
uh, really complex algorithms to do whatever we wanted. If it's Facebook, if you remember the initial stages of Facebook, there was no such thing as tagging. Tagging comes a lot later. And that's because they have managed to collect enough images that, that's the amount of data I'm talking about to be able to do such kind of technology. So that's called the unreasonable effectiveness of it. It's a really interesting paper. If you have some time, make sure you look through it. Um, but those two things combined kind of led to the explosion of AI. So why the hype? If artificial intelligence is you know, what it is, why are we talking so much about it? And why is it such an important technology? So, and I, I don't even think it's a hype. I just think it's, it's, it's a great thing, right? So why are we, talking about what's the power with AI. And to understand this, I kind of need to take you back to something very, something we're very familiar with and something that is very common in computer science is, you know, the cat and dog kind of game. So if I give you this image and tell you to look at it, you will clearly tell me what's a cat and what's an image, uh, what's a dog, right? It's super easy for you. But for the computer, this is not easy task. A computer cannot tell the difference. But for a computer to be able to tell the difference, we need to train the computer to know the difference. And how do we train the computer to know the difference between a cat and a dog? It's not a really easy thing. And that's the whole concept of training in artificial intelligence. Just like a baby learns step by step, what is a cat, what is a dog? And it starts calling it a cat and it starts calling it a dog. And when a child sees enough cats, then it will know that these are cats. That's exactly how the computer algorithm learns. So the idea was we feed these cat images and their labels, like, you know, give it an image, give a computer an image and give it a label tell it that this is a cat, so this is the image, and this image belongs to the cat. And it, we get the output that it's a cat. And if we have enough cats and enough dogs, then the computer finally learns how to tell the difference between the two. And that is why the unreasonable effectiveness of data comes in. If we have enough cats and enough dogs, then we're able to train this algorithm, which is a neural network. I'm not gonna go into the details of how a neural network works, but this is a visual representation of how a neural network works, just like it works in the brain. So we're gonna be able to tell the difference between a cat and a dog and computers can be able to tell that. Just if we give them enough images and have a decent algorithm, right? And if we can do that, that means we can go to the next thing. They can classify more objects, right? They can tell us, and for example, they can tell what's a dog um, and the different types of dogs and whatever. And it turns out they can even tell more objects than a human. If I asked you today, how many objects do you know? I don't think you know up to a million objects. Right? I don't think you know up to a million objects, but it turns out a computer can know up to a million objects just by seeing different images of different uh, labels and learning these kind of things and it can learn. And if it can do that, then when it give it an image like this, it can tell you uh, what's a human, what's a castle, what's a statue, what's a light, and that kind of thing. So it can clearly tell from the, um, remember how we started with cats and dogs, right? Now we're here, we have advanced, gone a little bit, so we can classify an image just by looking at it, just the way humans look at it. We can do that and we can tell what is what. And if we can do that, then we can fit that kind of technology into a car and a car can drive itself. Because really, what's in a car anyway? The acceleration and the braking, that's purely mechanical, you can do that. The bigger part is the thinking and driving, right? It's the thinking and driving. How do you decide to stop? How do you know what is you know, in front of you? How do you decide when to change directions? But if a computer can look at that image and know, oh, there's a car, there's a human, there's a road, there's a bumper, there's a whatever, then it means the car can finally drive itself. And if the car can drive itself, then we have you know, AI in cars and cars are driving themselves all around us and we can eliminate humans from cars. And this will bring an incredible amount of opportunities that I don't wanna talk into right now. But that is one of the things that we can do. And if we can do that, what else can we do? We can feed the computer images of medical, um, you know, medical images like this one, an x-ray, and a computer can tell us if this patient has a pneumonia or not. And it turns out it can do it a lot faster than the most trained doctor in the world. It can do this in less than 10 seconds. What does that mean for us? It's unbelievable. This, this, this is, we never imagined we could get here. And if it can tell us what if, if an, if an x-ray, um, by just looking at an x-ray, if, an, if a patient has pneumonia or not, if there's cancer or not, oh man, the amount of opportunities we have here are unlimited. So that's just in the medical field. But there's a lot more that we can do. In astronomy, we can look further deep into the, into the universe and be able to tell which ones are stars and which are not stars. In healthcare, we can understand, you know, 
if patients have diseases or not. In transport, we can drive ourselves. In agriculture, we can take a simple photo of a plant and the, 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 the AI will be able to tell us if that plant has a problem or not. In education, we can use this to teach. We can use this to deliver lessons, you know? E-commerce, we're shopping with it. Social media, we can chat with our friends. We can know where our friends are. We can, we can just look at an image and, you know, Facebook is going to suggest us who are our friends and who are not our friends. And finance, we can make more intelligent decisions because you know, computers can look into the future and say, how is the stock market going to behave? So these are a ton load of opportunities that AI presents for us. And this is just amazing. So when we talk about the fourth revolution, this is what we mean. This is the fourth revolution. But now where do we come in as Africans? What's our role here? If you look at most of what I've talked about, all this technology is happening in the US, it's happening in, um, in Europe, in Japan, and all these kind of places. But where do we come in? And what's our role in this? And really that's kind of like the, the kind of point I wanted to drive home today. It's, it's sort of like in this line, where do we come in in this revolution? Because this, this is not something that happened. We're not learning about man went to the moon in 1963 or 1967. It's happening as we watch, we are part of this. And that's the beautiful thing about it. So some years back, the National Academy of Engineering presented what was called the Grand Engineering Challenges of Our Generation. And these challenges are so significant that they're some of the, by the Department of Energy in the US, these are some of the most funded um, research areas today. Um, all of them are super, super interesting. And I think working on any of them is the biggest privilege in the world, you know, advanced personalized learning, you know, enhancing virtual reality, engineer better medicines, you know, right now we're having corona. We kind of need to figure out how to engineer better medicines, you know, restore and improve urban infrastructure. Nairobi has a hectic problem of traffic and, and you know, just poor planning. How do, these are grand engineering challenges. And whenever I think about it, I usually think, what am I doing about this? You know, what, what's my part in this, right? Um, and if you look at the last one, it's called engineer the tools for scientific discovery. And AI is one of those tools that can be used for scientific discovery. But this is in the National Academy of Engineering. What about us? What about Kenya? What's, what's our role here? Because our problems are not exactly this. We're not trying to prevent a nuclear war. We don't even have nuclear weapons, right? So our problems are not exactly this, but we have a different set of problems. And these are the sustainable development goals. And today, um, I just wanna encourage all of you, if you're not working on one of these technology as sustainable development goals, you need to pick one and start working on it. These are the real problems we're having right now, especially in our world. You know, one of the sustainable, number one sustainable development goals, we need to end poverty. We have to end poverty. We need to make sure that people are not starving anymore. We, have, we need to have good healthcare and just people need to live you know, in a good environment and that kind of thing. We need to significantly improve um, education. And that's kind of my area. When I, when I think about the sustainable development goals, I usually think of myself working on goal number four, quality education. We need to come up, uh, we need to be able to have gender equality in the world right now. Um, and I talked earlier on about, you know, the invention of, you know, Alan Turing and all that kind of thing that happened. But what I didn't mention and what I wanted to mention at this particular point is that there was a really brilliant group of women scientists who were doing the heavy lifting, the mathematics and all that. When man went to the moon, there was an incredible, you know, a group of, uh, of female computer scientists who were doing that. The person who first gave us a, a programming language, or an idea of a modern lab programming language was Ada Lawrence. And one of the greatest honors today in computer science is the Ada Lawrence Award. So we need to have gender equality in our countries and in, in different places. So the sustainable development goals are many and they're complex, but my challenge to you is pick one and think how you can work on one. But on top of all that, how does AI help us to solve these uh, sustainable development goals? If you look at all of them, right, there is a way that sort of AI fits in. Number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. That is AI right there. And if we can do that, then there's so much we can do. Um, there's also like making sure everybody is getting a good job, right? A responsible, I mean, um, what is it called? Just, you know, sustainable jobs, sustainable environments. AI is helping, is creating thousands of jobs today. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit of that and what we're doing regarding that in a short while. So these are the sustainable development goals. And this is where we can fundamentally build upon our technology to focus on. We need to have peace, justice, and strong institutions in our country. AI can help us do that. Um, 
decent work and an economic growth, like I mentioned, there are thousands of jobs right now um, regarding AI. So this is, my, this is how I look at AI and its place in our environment in Africa and in different parts of the developing world because these sustainable goals concern us more than anything. And again, I wanna repeat, my challenge to you is if you're not working on any of the sustainable development goals, please pick one and just sort of have a commitment, even if it's in your head or in the, in the back of your mind, sort of have a commitment to work towards one of the sustainable development goals. Because really, if we can all work towards this, we're heading somewhere. So, but the sustainable development goals are not, you know, they, they are there to guide us. How do we do this? Uh, in 2018, the, the government of Kenya, through uh, um, uh, the Ministry of ICT, created a task force to understand distributed ledgers and artificial intelligence. And distributed ledgers is what we call blockchain technology. These are the two technologies that are kind of really gonna fuel um, how our countries move forward. And if you can see the government of Kenya putting an emphasis on this, it means this is so important. So, and they give a report and the report is out there, I highly recommend that you read, you read through it. And this report basically shows us how uh, we can use AI in the kind of progress that we want to make as a country. It talks about the, 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 the big four agenda that was the agenda of the president, uh, our president, before he kind of lost his mind and started singing some BBI nonsense. But that was kind of like, you know, it talks about how this fits into the plans we have for development and the, the people at the task force, and some of them are really brilliant. Uh, I mean, actually, all of them are really brilliant professors and, and, and technology leaders. They suggested, you know, concrete points that we can use AI to change our lives in Kenya. It talks about how we can use this in industry, how the government can have an AI policy that guides how we use AI in different companies and kind of things. But that's not really like, so that's kind of like from the government point of view. But what about how I think about this? So when I look at Africa, I, I think, and what I know about Africa is, first of all, we have the youngest population in the, in the world. Our population is so young. I think over 60% of our population is below 30. And that's a power. That is a huge power because that means we have such a significant, I mean, we have such a big uh, labor force that we can build upon. And we can equip this labor force with the right talent, then we can do wonders. Because if you look at the industrial revolutions that happened, they involved a lot of you know, human capital. And we have that, we have the youngest population. <coughs> so. That's how I see this from there. But also, Africa has the most, is the most diverse continent in terms of everything. We have the most spoken languages known to man. And the number of languages we have spoken or non spoken, that is data. That is so much data that we have that we can use today, build you know, systems that will preserve our culture, that will kind of like enable us to communicate in whatever languages we want. We are diverse in that sense. We are diverse in agriculture. All the way from Egypt down to Cape Town, you're gonna to find anything you can ever imagine from deserts to really thick forests in Congo, all the way to ice you know, caps back uh, down in South Africa. So we have that. And the other thing, which kind of seems like a, a disadvantage, but it's not a disadvantage, is we have no legacy systems. Tell you what, when I went, uh, when I moved to Spain, I was surprised at how things are slow here. Like, you know, banks, seem not to make sense at all to me. And I was telling my friends like, you know, if, I did, if, this, if this was in Kenya, I would simply send an you know, M-Pesa and I have the money. But here I have to kind of manually go to the bank, sign papers, blah, blah, blah. It's crazy. But that's because these kind of like developed world have legacy systems that are not easy to get rid of. We don't have such legacy systems. If today we wanted to digitize all the information of um, cities in Kenya, it was pretty easy because we don't have like, you know, old systems that we need, we need to change and figure out how to go about them. So we don't have legacy systems and that's an advantage, which means we can build with the latest, most advanced technology. And so how does AI come into Africa and how do we leverage AI into, um, into our lives? Agriculture is one of the uh, strongest things that we can do. I saw um, um, uh, in South Africa, 2018, Jeff Dean, who is the head of Google, was giving a talk about um, AI and how people in Tanzania are using it. Students from universities in Tanzania have built apps that you know just take a picture of a cassava and it tells you, you know, what's wrong with this cassava? Does it need more water? Does it need this? Does it need this? So we don't need like that complex technology. I mean that you know complex expertise because we don't have to train. We don't have time to train all this expertise. But with technologies like AI, we can significantly improve agricultural production. And if we do that, then we can you know, manage to feed ourselves. 
And then we have the healthcare gap. Think about it if a nurse could diagnose you for anything and with just a single mobile app. Because what happens today is that we don't have that much many doctors in the country. And trust me, it costs an incredible amount of money to train a doctor. And by the way, we should all be concerned right now because we are losing doctors like crazy with COVID. So if we are not, if, if we can leverage technology to use the few doctors we have, but empower them with the right technology, then we can get somewhere. I know a group that is working on, you know, a small, like if, if you've ever been to an MRI machine, it's a really complex device and it's a huge device and we don't have many of them in Kenya. Uh, there's some group that is working on, um, um, you know, how can we understand uh, see through without necessarily having to go through an MRI machine? When I was in my master's, one of my friends from Tanzania was, asked, was working on diagnosing um, malaria and typhoid and all these kind of things by simply taking a photo of the, of the blood sample with his phone. And it was an AI built up. AI can do that. So we can bridge the health gap, the healthcare gap. I'm not saying we can replace doctors. No, we will never be able to replace doctors, at least not in our lifetime. But we can empower doctors with the right tools and we can bridge the healthcare gap and improve significantly the kind of healthcare our people can get. Because a doctor operating in Lamu, where I come from, doesn't have the tools that a doctor in Nairobi has. But if a doctor in Nairobi can guide a doctor in Lamu using technology and using AI, then we can head somewhere. So we can bridge the healthcare gap. Another point I see this is education. Healthcare, I mean, we should be able to fix that. But we also need to think about education and how we teach. We don't have enough teachers, we all know that. But we need to be able to modernize our education and AI can help us get there. Because now um, natural language processing has developed so much, you cannot tell the difference between a human and a robot. If it costs so much to teach uh, students um, with one teacher, then AI can teach so many of these students. So there is a lot of gap in education. And I'm, and I'm really going to recommend you to read through the, the, the AI task force report because it talks explicitly about this governance. We can improve our government. We can, we, can, we can almost get rid of corruption if we can replace the humans that are kind of ruining these things with better technology and better tools. We can eliminate this system of having to pay somebody so that they can do something for us, right? So there's a lot of opportunities in this for us. And then we have millions of sustainable jobs that we can get from AI. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, in the next slides. But there's a lot of jobs we can create from AI and there are a lot of jobs already in AI. But how do we get there? How do we get to using AI in our lives in Africa? And, and how, do we use, how do we get to using AI to change our lives? Um, we need to significantly invest in education and research. And I use this uh, picture of a robot with a book because when I was starting my journey of AI, I was in um, final year university undergraduate and this, there was a course on Coursera that was teaching AI. And that's kind of where I learned my basics. Um, it was printed by Andrew and G again. Um, I learned a lot of the basics uh, of machine learning and artificial intelligence from that course. And I was able to access this because I have access to internet and I, was, uh, I had access to a computer and I can do these kind of things. But we need to invest more in education and research. And I'm going to, again, talk about what we are doing about this currently. So we need to figure out how do we get more people interested in AI and how do we get more people researching in AI? Because for us to be able to build these systems, we need people who can build the system. But if you're not training people to do these kind of things, then we have a huge problem because what's gonna happen is that Europe is doing that. US is doing that, China is doing that, Japan is doing that, right? Currently we have, I mean, you can do a PhD in artificial intelligence in so many universities around the world. We need to be able to, we, now my university, the University um, of Catalonia just launched a bachelor's degree in artificial intelligence. That wasn't hard of before. We need to figure out how we can get there. If you look at the global market for, 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 the, for jobs in data science and AI, it's incredible. There are estimated 700,000 jobs openings by 2020, and that's not a lie. If you open um, uh, your LinkedIn profile today and look at the kind of jobs we're having, there's a ton load of jobs about AI and artificial intelligence and data science, but the demand, the demand is so much that we don't have enough talent to fit this gap. So, as Africans, we have a really young population. How do we leverage that? We need to bridge that gap and we can bridge that gap. So we also need to invest significantly on infrastructure. You know, AI doesn't happen 
in your mobile phone or whatever, even though you can renovate and, and make it happen. This is the Barcelona supercomputer uh, where I work. Um, one of the most powerful supercomputers in Europe, currently being upgraded also to be the leading research center in Europe. Uh, we need to be able to build these kind of systems and we need the expertise to build that. So we need to be training the right people and building the right infrastructure to get there. This is Barcelona Supercomputing Center from a different angle. It's, it's, it's usually called the most beautiful supercomputer in the world. It's really beautiful. Uh, it's located inside a church. And, uh, and uh, people around here usually like to joke that, you know, in the olden days, we used to go to church to get answers. But nowadays, we can still log into church and get answers and that kind of thing. But yeah, anyway, uh, it's a funny joke that we make around here. So it's a really beautiful machine. Uh, sometimes I just go here on the upper roof and, you know, just sit there and internalize things like how far we have come as humans to be able to get here. And it's really incredible to be part of this, to be on the front line of the research that is getting us here, to be actively taking part in the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. It's a different feeling. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the, the Spanish um, supercomputer. And the Japanese have uh, currently the best, uh, the, 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 the most powerful supercomputer in the world that was announced this year uh, at Riken, Fugaku. I had the privilege of watching there uh, last year for three months um, in, 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 in this infrastructure. And again, it's, it's, it's incredible. You know, you, you see the kind of things the world is doing and you're left in awe. And for me, despite the fact that you know, I'm able to work in these kind of centers and do this kind of job. It hurts me that I'm not able to do this uh, where I would really love to do it. But that pain is not gonna last long because I know people that are working to make sure we're having this kind of technologies being built in our country. And so those two things, we need to be able to invest in the right infrastructure and we need to be able to uh, build the talent that is needed for that kind of thing. So what's happening in artificial intelligence in Africa? Guys, you might think there's nothing that is happening. There's a lot that is happening. Uh, Google AI has opened an office in Ghana. They did that in 2018. If, you, if you're not worried, you should be worried right now. Because what that tells you is global companies are seeing the potential of AI in Africa and they're coming in to grab the piece of cake. Exactly what they did in the Berlin conference when they petitioned Africa into small pieces. So Google AI is in Africa. They, they, uh, um, Mustafa Sisse, who uh, is a brilliant computer scientist, by the way, trained in France, uh, currently leading Google AI in Africa. He's leading Google AI in, in Africa and they're doing incredible stuff there. IBM Research, they're in Nairobi, they're in Johannesburg. I think they're also in Tunisia. Global companies are seeing the potential here and they're coming in big time. Microsoft, Microsoft Research, currently hiring in Nairobi actually, they're doing Again, they're in Africa. And they're doing all these amazing research because they realize there's potential in AI and there's so many unexploited opportunities in Africa and they're coming in for that. But we, as Africans, we need to ensure that we are participating in this digital transformation. I cannot emphasize enough how that is important. But we don't just need to be participating in this like uh, spectators. We have to make sure we are creators and owners of this technology. That is what I believe. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that we are participating in this digital transformation as creators and owners? I mean, I mentioned before that we need to invest in education and we need to invest in infrastructure and that kind of thing. But yeah, there's a lot more happening. And uh, from mid this year, I started working with uh, uh, um, brilliant people from Impact Africa where they, we have a school called Jenga School that is basically built to unleash Africa's genius to solve global problems not African problems, but to solve global problems. So we are addressing the talent gap. And what we're doing at Jenga School is basically training the next generation of artificial intelligence engineers and computer scientists that can help solve global problems. And how we're doing this is a four pillar strategy where we have top instructors from both Kenya and abroad with many years of experience that are kind of combining together with industry leaders and trying to build an AI film, an AI, um, um, uh, course that is geared towards us and not just us that can help us take these opportunities because the opportunities are there but we need the technical know-how to be able to take that kind of knowledge and I'm part of this and I'm really excited to be part of this uh, I'm one of the instructors there I'm teaching the foundations of, of, of data science and AI there and uh, I mean when I was in Turkey I always knew that at some point I was going to go back home 
And I've, I've never lost that dream. I always believe that, you know, I'm going to go back home. And that's actually very, very soon. And for me to be able to participate in this uh, um, course development, curriculum development as an instructor is such an honor because I'm working directly with, uh, with an institution based in Kenya that is Kenyan, never means, but we are combining knowledge and expertise from the best of the best in the world. We have our advisor who is Jeff Dean from uh, uh, head of the Google AI research, one of the most brilliant computer engineers of our generation. I mean, it's such a privilege to just see Jeff Dean speak. But that's Jeff Dean in Google. We need to be building our own Jeff Deans back home and in Kenya and in Africa. And that's what we're doing right now at Jenga School. So I'm, 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 I'm part of this and I'm, I'm, I'm super happy to be part of this. We're doing a great job there. I'm teaching there a course on uh, Foundations of Data Science. If you're interested uh, or if you want to know more about that, you can let me know or you can reach out to, um, to, 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 to the Jenga School administration, info at jengaschool.com. And uh, that is my part. And that's what I feel like I'm doing to bridge this gap. And I'm taking that opportunity. So thank you very much. Um, that's my email right there. If you ever want to reach out to me, uh, that's my um, website you can see. Sometimes I rant on Twitter about different things in technology and what's happening and that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So, um, and I want to see if we have any kind of like questions uh, or anything basically. We can, we can now open the discussion. I think I've taken a lot more time than I planned. So we can open the discussion. And uh, yeah, any questions, anything you have to say? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the admin, so uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, hi. Hey. Um, I was wondering, since we were explaining that we're headed into the, what's this? the fourth revolution here mm -hmm. with AI, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at sort of the jobs within the service industry, like hospitality, uh -huh. especially right now during COVID-19 where human contact is discouraged yeah. a lot. Uh -huh. um, AI seems to be taking that spot very quickly. Very many robots being used in the, in the hospitality for example, in Dubai, there is a cafe completely run by robots. Uh -huh. Does this mean that there will be a future where the number of people below the poverty line will be increased? So that's another thing. Like, I usually hear people talk about, you know, like the number of people below the poverty line, you mean like uh, because they don't have jobs? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's that's kind of like what everybody said when, when computers were starting to come in, right? When, when computers started coming in in the 1980s, everybody thought they're going to be replaced. But here's the, here's the interesting thing, actually. They're not replacement of jobs. It's just creation of better jobs. It's really just creation of better jobs. So remember before, somebody who was a secretary that was using the typewriter just went to school and became a better secretary who could do spreadsheets, who could do uh, access, who could do whatever. And they, their lively, I mean, their life just significantly improved. So it's not like we're going to have many more people losing jobs. I think people worry so much about the number of jobs that AI is taking than the number of jobs AI is actually creating. And the number of jobs AI is creating is way, way more than the number of jobs AI is taking. So it's kind of just a shift. It's not creation of, it's not loss of jobs. It's a trans, trans, um, how can I say, transformation of jobs. So uh, I, if, if, if you think AI is going to take jobs, just think about how many jobs AI is going to create, right? Yeah, so that, that's how I think about it. And, and I know that it's happening a lot in, in the COVID uh, times, you know. I saw a, a video in, um, of a hospital in Norway where, you know, there is barely any human contact, you know. AI is doing pretty much everything. Robots are coming in, giving the doctors their their uniforms, you know, helping them change, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, this is Light Academy Alumni Association Office. My name is Michelle. Uh -huh. I'm the office secretary. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. And we have learned a lot and a lot. And uh, we thank you on behalf of the office and on behalf of the association. Uh, now, to everyone who attended, we are very grateful. And Albert is here to answer your questions. 
So if you have questions, I'm not going to waste much time, but to invite you all, ask your questions. You can ask them from the chat, or you could just uh, open the mic and ask. Thank you so much, Albert. Thank you. Um, I think uh, somebody's asking, Albert. Yeah. I think. Uh, I am more worried about computer literacy that will be needed for the transformation. Anything on that? Well, um, yeah, the, the computer literacy. I mean, <laughs> I am also worried about this thing, honestly. Um, there's a lot of uh, literacy that is needed for us to actually transform and get that where we need. But like I said, you know, one of the things that I really believe in is education. And, uh, you know, Jenga School is just one of the schools that is trying to do this. But we need more schools that, have, I mean, we need more people to do the literacy. That is required. How many uh, um, Kenyans are computer? How many Kenyans can program, right? And there's a time when I was in school, my master's, um, I would say that coding like, is the new literature. You need, you need, you need, you need to be able to, like being able to read and write. So coding is that. And if we are not, guys, please switch off your mic unless you're like speaking so that we can communicate easily. So we need to build a skill set that understands code and we need to build a generation that can code from a very early age. And one of the things that I'm really grateful about going to Light Academy was because by the time I was finishing my high school, guys, I could code. I knew programming. When I was going to uni, for me, it was a walkover. I was just like, I uh, kind of did things in high school, you know? So that is just, if Light Academy is able to do that, then there needs to be more schools that can do that to train people to learn how to code from a very early age. So it's like reading and writing, right? If we can train people to read and write, uh, we can train people to code from a very early age because really coding is as important as it is to speak. That's how I think of this thing. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, Prudence Chepkwech. He has a question. He's raised his hand. Yes, Prudence, please. Prudence, uh, well, thank you very much. Sorry, this is not Prudence. I'm with Prudence, and uh, I was glad to join in. This is her friend. My name is Paris, mm -hmm. and I'm in agriculture. Thank you so much, uh, Albert, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, well, uh, when I hear artificial intelligence, it's something that is really music to my ears. And uh, I think this is just so timely because um, my interest in artificial intelligence is really like to drive agriculture in Kenya and Africa at large to yeah. the next level. Yeah. And uh, well, I, I'm really looking forward to like having this discussion uh, aside, but for sure there's need for education okay. and uh, also need for invest, investing in agriculture in this country because uh, I mean, we, we, this is a sector that is a contributor of about 46% GDP. Yeah. So this is something that cannot be left behind. And uh, currently I'm working with a company, uh, Bayer, uh -huh. which just acquired Monsanto. Uh -huh. Monsanto is very big on artificial intelligence. And when I hear this, I'm really like envious because we are not ready as Africa for this. And uh, we only see the white population ready to scramble for Africa. It's not about scrambling for gold or, or I don't know what mines. It's nothing to do with that. It's about the resource that they see Africa being. And the resource is about um, the untapped uh, uh, areas of uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence where this can be explored yeah. and who is there to do that. <laughs> so I think I, I really like what Jenga School is doing. And uh, I mean, let's go guys and uh, emancipate our young people. Like what the government is doing, uh, well, it's, it's, it's doing its role, but this thing can only be driven by the private sector. Yeah. And uh, Albert, um, you have my whole support, uh, kudos on that. I really don't have any question. I think this is something else we can just take it offline. And uh, this is um, a sector that has immense, um, immense uh, uh, opportunities. And uh, right now, I mean, for Bayer to acquire Monsanto, it was, I mean, you guys have heard about litigations and what have you that has been happening in the US. It wasn't all about just that. It was just about artificial intelligence. Yeah. That is a technology Bayer was struggling to buy. Yeah. 
So uh, when I look at it, I really, uh, at, at, my, at my level, I'm also looking at positioning myself. Yes, I'm in agriculture, but I'm keen on developing myself and seeing how I can be strategic uh, matters, artificial intelligence, when you talk of diseases, diseases in crops, identification of why farmers need to stop using a lot of fertilizers, but just apply just what is needed, you know? So this is very exciting. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really... I'm really excited in, uh, in agriculture and, and, uh, and I'm very passionate about agriculture. I actually just recently I started a farm back in my, in my place. And, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and for me, it's not just a farm. I'm trying to look at how can we scale this, you know, significantly with AI. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. I'm a researcher. So for me, every time I see this kind of problem, my brain just starts working like, okay, how can we solve this? How can we, what can we do about this? So there's a lot of uh, potential in that. And one of the alumni from Light Academy, Efantes, is doing some incredible job uh, on IoT for farming, which is again, amazing. And kind of, like, there's a way we can combine that with the cloud and agriculture and significantly improve the potential. And uh, yeah, at Jenga, we are trying, um, honestly, uh, for me, it's, it's an honor to be at Jenga, to be sort of like participating directly in making sure that we are training the next generation of, of artificial intelligence uh, experts. Because I mean, at the end of the day, um, I can do my part, but I'm abroad and I, I really want to come back and I know for sure that I'm going to come back. Um, but yeah, so we need more of this everywhere. We need, we need more AI research. Trust me, I'm in Barcelona and there are so many jobs on LinkedIn, like so many companies in Barcelona that cannot get enough people to work. Actually, just recently, the Catalan ministry said there's about 100,000 jobs created in Barcelona for AI and data science, but we have only about 30,000 people that can fit these roles. So we need to be thinking about that. And we have a huge young population. I mean, we, need, we really need to be thinking about this. So yeah, thank you very much. We can have the conversation later and we can continue that um, somewhere else later. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Albert. Uh, before I invite the next person, mm -hmm. Somebody say, do you think as Kenyans, it's Adnan Muhammad, I think, do you think as Kenyans we try to imitate the Western so much that we ignore our own talent? As you think about that, you will also give Kelsey McCallie to ask you a question. So you can start with that as we welcome Kelsey. Yeah, do, we, do we give it so much to the West? I mean, I don't know. My, I mean, my, my take on this is like, look, guys, um, I left, I mean, I didn't leave Kenya because there, there was not universities to train me to be a good computer scientist. There are universities, you know, incredible universities in Kenya. And I know some of the professors working there because I'm currently working with those professors at Jenga school. But I know that, you know, I left Kenya because, you know, you kind of need that knowledge. I mean, you, you've got to accept that, you know, we didn't invent the Turing test. You know, we've got to accept that, you know, we didn't build the supercomputer. So these guys were already ahead of us. So we, we're playing catch up game here, right? And, and one of the things I was saying was that the good thing is that, um, uh, about this catch-up game is in the AI era, we don't really need to play the catch-up game because it's happening now. So we can be part of this now. So we don't need to imitate the West, right? We need to build our own technologies. We need to build our own research centers that are not necessarily imitating from the West. Yes, AI is there. AI is universal. Anybody can build AI. So it's not a matter of just copying it from the West. We can build what is rightfully ours because our problems are local problems we need to be able i mean we need to be able to solve problems that are there locally Thank and um, i think paul asked me what uh, resources platforms do you join for anyone looking to get started in ai in the science field there's a lot of resources out there um one of the where i personally started was coursera like i mentioned um uh, and it has a ton of courses on ai I'm currently teaching at Jenga. So if you're interested in that, you know, info at jengaschool.com. Uh, I'm one of the instructors there, but I'm not the only instructor. We have brilliant professors uh, from JCOAT, from uh, um, um, what's the other university, Jedan Kimadi, and, you know, guidance from Google and that kind of thing. So we have this curriculum that we have put together. So if you're looking to start up on AI, I suggest, you know, you can reach me or reach uh, the, the management, but you can also go online. Like there's so many resources, especially on, uh, uh, on Coursera where it's kind of like I started, you know, I started my AI journey and Paul will remember this because we were together with Paul in, in Turkey. And when we're finishing to uh, fourth year, there was like this hype. I mean, it's kind of getting to be a big deal, but no one really know what it's going to become. So Paul told me, um, what's this AI thing? You know, what's this AI thing that is happening? Paul was doing uh, electrical engineering. I was doing computer science, uh, computer engineering. And that's how, and then we took the machine learning course together. And the machine learning course we took was just a replica of the course that was online. Well, I, it didn't really help me become a machine learning expert, but it kind of 
gave me an idea of what machine learning is. So I also started with the online resources that are available. But I believe we need you know, proper STEM schools that can teach this thing, because online is online, right? And even right now at Jenga, we are offering our classes on, I teach all the classes online. But then we have that personalized level. I can reach to you, you know, I can come to you, uh, ask you what questions you're solving. I can open your code and work with you on that particular piece of code. So it kind of brings in a different feeling. But yeah, if you're looking for resources, I highly recommend you start with Coursera. Um, you can reach out to me. I, uh, I, I left my email there. But Coursera is a really good point to start with. Thank you. Thank you. I want to give Kelsey McCulley a chance to speak before we read the other comments coming. Yes, Kelsey, please. You can ask your question. Hi, hi, thanks. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, I just wanted to sort of phrase my question mostly as, as advice. Um, as a fourth year student, I am actually kind of an AI enthusiast and I really just wanted mm -hmm. to know your opinion on maybe. I'm um, sorry, um, I didn't get that. Sometimes say uh, can you hear me yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, i was saying that when when it comes to applying for jobs um like after leaving uni uh most of the job requirements in the field of ai or uh, data science maybe they require sort of too much so i just wanted to know like your opinion on where to start like where do i gain that experience that they actually Sort of want me to have before actually getting a job or what can i do to to improve improve myself basically good that's that's a really good question and that's a question i get a lot uh because you know like you know companies are picky they can you know they think they want like two year experience or three year experience or they want like phd level data scientist and that kind of thing. but that's that's really changing a lot uh and recently companies like google have stopped asking for computer science degrees to hire you. They just basically, hey, can you program? Yes, we can hire you. Um, so that's kind of changing slowly. But in terms of where you can start, I, I usually tell people that you kind of need to start building your portfolio. And even with my students right now in the foundations class, that's something I'm really insisting on. I'm telling them, hey, whatever piece of code we write, I need you to put this on GitHub. I need you to make this accessible. You need to start building your portfolio. So that when companies are looking for you, they need to know what you can offer. So you, you, my advice would be you kind of need to start building your portfolio either on GitHub or you know, whatever resource you have, then it's your own website. And there, there are so many interesting projects you can work on that. Another thing I really recommend is the internships. There are always so many internship opportunities that you can use to sort of develop yourself and like um, go there. But my thing here is you can start with entry level job. The entry level data scientist jobs that don't require so much as, you know, they just ask you, hey, can you program in Python? Because Python is one of the most fundamental languages in data science, right? In AI. They say, can you program in Python? Yes, we, we're gonna teach, but we're gonna, we can, we can hire you and we can continue. But also that changes a lot with country to country because for example, I'm in Spain and I know so many of my friends who got hired even though they couldn't program. The company was like, can you do math? Yes, uh, don't worry, we'll teach you the programming. But that's a different scenario. That's because there is not enough talent, right? So companies are trying to do whatever they can. They're going to hire you and then they're going to train you and, and that kind of thing. So for entry level, I highly recommend you start sort of like building your portfolio, uh, significantly start working on Python programming and uh, build up on that. Like on GitHub, push your projects out there, get them known and, and, and reach out, right? Reach out, guys, reach out. Reach out to people, reach out to me, reach out to whoever you think you can reach out for whatever guidance that is there. At Barcelona Sport Computing Center, we usually have internship opportunities every year. And I think last year I posted it on my Twitter and I was like, guys, can you apply for these opportunities? I mean, they seem like they're high level opportunities, but hey, it's all about knocking on the doors. Eventually the doors open. So start with the internship opportunities um, that are there, entry level data science. They're not gonna pay you much, but in a year or two, you will be in a position where you can determine what you want to be paid. Yes, Albert. Um, thank you. I want to read certain uh, questions that people have raised on the chat. The first one, somebody uh, quickly, maybe you can answer this quickly. Hi, Moses. I think he means Albert. The classes at Jenga school are purely online. Okay. Somebody was asking about yeah, whether purely. Jenga is uh, online or not. Somebody answered that. Mm -hmm. So how can people in software engineering background start from to build systems? that can leverage AI? I think maybe you've answered that. Mm -hmm. uh, I might not know the best programming language for AI, but Python might be a good start. Yeah, yeah, Somebody's sure. asking the best language for 
Yeah. yeah, Python is definitely the place to start. Um, even at uh, what I'm teaching right now, I'm just teaching from, uh, with, uh, with Python. Though I teach a little bit of R because R is very important for statistics and that kind of thing. But for AI, uh, Python is where you start. You need to know Python. And right. if you want to do like, more advanced stuff, then you can know C and C++. But you really need, because a lot of the frameworks that we have for AI are purely built in Python. You, know, you, need, you need to know Python. Great. So another question which I think is the last one on this section. How do, we, how do you keep up with all these technologies? Just knowing AI is not enough, you want us to learn about cloud containerization, etc. What do you say? And <laughs> your opinions on the future of GN? Yeah, on the future of guns. That's an interesting question. Yeah. So, uh, wow, keeping up is a, is a huge task. Um, trust me, it, it's really hard. So what I do is I mostly keep up on the things that, you know, really interest me. And because I work on machine learning, but I don't work so much on business level machine learning. I work on supercomputing level machine learning. And maybe I didn't talk a little bit about this, but my research involves uh, taking this really large machine learning models that we're building for language processing and whatever, and trying to break them and seeing how we can train these really large models in supercomputers. So my, my, my expertise is a mixture of supercomputing and machine learning. And it's a really sweet spot because you're able to see the best of two worlds. So I, I generally tend to keep up with news in supercomputing and you know, a little bit of machine learning, but more on the scalability side of machine learning, right? So for example, there's another time I was trying to use Docker and, and this is embarrassing because I haven't used, Docker is one of the containerization tools. I haven't done that in ages. And I realized it took me such a long time to just figure out how to do it. So it's not like I cannot do it. I mean, I'm, I'm a trained computer scientist. I have the background knowledge. I know how these things work. It's just that it's hard to keep up with these things, right? It's really hard to keep up with these things. But what I do is I pick the things that interest me and I just keep up with those. I'm not trying to keep up with everything. I cannot keep up. Somebody asked my opinion on feature of guns. Wow. Uh, so, so just to give a little bit of background. So what guns are, it's generative adversarial neural networks. And what they do is, you know, trying to generate, so a simple example is trying to generate an image from another image. So if I have enough image of people, can I generate new people from this? And guns, it turns out, are able to do this significantly. And they've done that so much that sometimes we're not even able to tell who is a fake human and who is a real human, right? So the future of guns is, is amazing. I think uh, there's a lot more that can be done with that. Uh, though we are still limited to how big the models can get, but there's a lot happening in guns and uh, and, and I, I really don't know. I mean, for me, sometimes I think, you know, the future of guns is a bit scary because if, if we can no longer be able to tell a real image from an unreal image, it's, uh, it's a bit, uh... but anyway, that's just my hype thingy. But in reality, I think it's an exciting technology. It has so many use cases um, and we are seeing a lot of that currently being developed. Uh, and uh, by the way, I saw a really interesting paper on, on COVID. You know how, um, so guns kind of like fight each other, right? We have a model that is trying to cheat another model and another model that's trying to cheat another model. And they use this technology to develop uh, an understanding of the mutation of the COVID, uh, of the COVID uh, virus. And that was a really interesting research. I mean, I don't know the, all the details because it was, it's, it's a paper that won the best award recently, but I couldn't follow up on that. Somebody else is asking, what's, the, what's this GPT-3 tool that is supposed to change everything? What do we expect? <laughs> Yeah, um, so, uh, so GPT-3 was, GPT was released, I think, this year, early this year, by, um, uh, what's, what's the name of this? I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but it's one of the top leading um, in AI, and it's a, new, it's a natural language um, thing. And what it does is it can basically, remember in high school, if you look at an antica composition, you just input the first few words. So what's happening with GPT-3 is that it's going to change a lot of things because you can just input the first sentence and it's going to write an entire essay for you. It's writing essays, it's writing compositions, it's writing news, it's writing everything. But it's not like it's, it's going to change everything. Right? It's, I mean, this is just one of the very, um, yeah, it's from the Elon Musk group. Yeah, open AI, exactly, open AI. Um, so what's happening is that, you know, it, it generates text, it's a, it's a natural language processing model, the most advanced natural uh, language processing model that we have ever seen. And it's able to do an incredible job in, in natural language. And people are starting to ask, uh, what's gonna happen? But recently it was tested with a medical equation, like, you know, uh, what should I do if I have this? And it, it started talking about, you know, you should go kill yourself. Um, so these are the kind of dangers we have in AI, by the way. I never talked a bit about dangers of AI, but there are significant dangers in AI that we need to think about. 
and that we need to research about, especially, and, and I think I need to talk about this, especially in uh, when we are adopting these technologies, because for example, people have done research that shows that, for example, the AI that the police use is very much biased towards black people. So we have this pseudoscience thing that tells, you know, if you give an image, they can tell whether it's a criminal or not. And it turns out that it was really biased towards uh, um, uh, uh, black people. And, you know, AI is a black box. Nobody knows what really happens inside. So we need to be careful about this. You know, we cannot just pick an AI and give it to the police. Imagine giving an AI and giving it to the Kenyan police and they're doing whatever they want without necessarily having human supervision. There's some dangers that we kind of need to talk about and we need to think about those ones. But I think that's a topic of another day, but it's worth thinking uh, through that, you know, AI is not just, you know, the beautiful part and, you know, diagnosing patients and, and, and doing amazing stuff. But there's some serious dangers in AI. Uh, um, thank you, Albert. There's some other questions. Uh, somebody asked, uh, speaking about, you know, dangers of uh, AI and uh, the other sides of it, somebody is asking, do you see AI or data opportunities in the political space in Africa? In the political? Space in Africa. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, guys, don't you know how Uhuru won the first presidency? I mean, that was purely data science. That was purely AI. I mean, there was not, <laughs> there was not a doubt about that. That was just AI, right? Uh, we all know how, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, even they made a movie about it, how he actually won the election. So it turns out that if you can mine enough data about people, you can re-engineer these and sort of make them think in a certain way, right? Um, and that's exactly how they, I mean, though this is not, a very good. I mean, I would I would personally not work on such a thing. But uh, the thing is that what they did was Facebook released an incredible amount of data, and and and, and Cambridge Analytica used this data to help politicians in different parts of the world win elections. Why? Because there's so much information you give in social media. You tell them how you're feeling. You tell them who you like. You tell them what your opinions are. And Facebook is just mining this data, mining this data, and building models that can now it starts showing you ads or like starts giving you information that is kind of slowly rewiring your brain to think in a certain way. So for example, if it was in 2000, whatever, if you, if you are Uhuru versus, um, I think it was Uhuru versus Raila thingy. So if you're an Uhuru psychopath, it just keeps teaching you lots of negative information that might not be true about Raila. And if you are a Raila fanatic, it kept telling you so many information that are negative about, you know, Uhuru and that, that might not necessarily be a good thing. The problem is we are releasing so much data out there. I think we need to kind of, like, European Union has already done that. And I think Kenya is doing that. Recently, a data commissioner was sworn in. We need to be careful about the kind of data we are giving out there because this data is being used against us, whether you like it or not. Um, if you Google today uh, looking for a certain Nike shoe, for the next one week, you're only going to be seeing other. So your data is being used against you and it's being used to feed you information that might be. So those are some of the dangers. Uh, and, and there's so many things that are being to control that. The European Union has the GDPR, you know, which is the general data protection rules that are, you know, really in place. And companies like Facebook and Google are suffering here because they cannot do whatever they want. But in places where we don't have these laws in place, I mean, I was super worried. And one of the reasons why, and I'm sorry to say this, one of the reasons why I never registered for a Huduma number nonsense they were telling us was because we don't have the data laws in place. We needed to first of all have deals in place so that we know that the data we are giving these people, they cannot use it against us. Because and I'm not speculating, it's super easy to cause a major problem with this data. So this is some of the dangers we need to be thinking about. Uh, but you know, we talk about them, we know that they happen, but what are we doing? But anyway, right now, I think the parliament has, uh, parliament is almost approving the data laws. So that's kind of safe. You know, at least we can be sure that our data is protected. At least we can be sure you know, the government cannot do stupid stuff with our data. Um, thank you so much. I think the other, the other one was hypothetically, can we have AI that runs government? I think it's what you just talked about. <laughs> yeah, but if we have an AI that runs government, because it's trained by people, it's gonna be just yeah. like uh, government, no? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I often get this comment that most companies in Kenya just use basic ML algorithms and shouldn't focus more on deep learning and NLP, though I'm really interested in this. Any advice? Well, Stephanie. Um, so Stephanie, um, yeah, I mean, 
I don't, I, I'm not really familiar with the Kenyan job market like that much. But um, the thing is that, uh, you know, deep learning right now is the kind of like big thing, right? It's what everybody is using. And maybe we don't have the necessary or the required, you know, uh, computing power to build that because you need really strong GPUs and supercomputers and this kind of things. And we might not necessarily have that. But the beauty of this is that even if you learn these tools, if you're an expert in deep learning and you're in Kenya, COVID changed everything. You can get a job wherever you want. Remote, most of my friends, uh, most of my developer friends in Kenya work for companies abroad. So in as much as you see, it seems like there are jobs right now in this area, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be limited to the jobs available locally. There's so many jobs that are remote right now. And if you're an expert in deep learning, you will definitely get a job. Uh, I'm, I'm so sure about that. You will definitely get a job because this, this is kind of like on-demand technology, right? It's, um, so don't discourage from, from deep learning, right? I mean, because this is really important technology. Um, and if you cannot get like a job locally, then there's so many remote positions. But I do believe in the next two or three years, the Kenyan job market will also go crazy with deep learning opportunities. Um, yes, Albert, the last one in this section, or not even the last one, uh, thinking AI is a solution to all our problems is dangerous in my opinion. Don't you think we need to underline the uh, other non-tech aspects of it, uh, e.g. Yeah. regulations, policies, e.g. fake news, deep yeah, fakes I, of I, the I, power to undermine nations, fan wars, etc. I think that's really important. And, uh, and that's what I said, like uh, I mentioned that in my talk, I mean, maybe I focus so much on the advantages of the AI, but there's some serious dangers in AI that we think we need to think about. But I, I, when I think about these dangers in AI, I also think of them as opportunities because it means we need to kind of like, you know, research more into the danger, what's happening with fake news, right? Right now we are able to manipulate people the way we want, right? We, we have algorithms that write an entire piece of news with, references and everything and everything is fake and that's a serious problem that's that's really a serious problem because what happens with that is that you can be able you are slowly manipulating what people think and what people do and we need to find we need to have the regulations in place to do that and that's why i was telling you um earlier that one of the reasons why i didn't sign up for the huduma number whatever was because there are no laws in place to make sure we are governing that but i think and um and i and, and this is what i strongly believe you guys are Kenyans, I am Kenyan. When we are voting, when we are making decisions on who will govern us, I mean, we need to make sure that these people kind of have an idea of what technology is. You saw the embarrassment that was when Zuckerberg was interviewed um, by the US Senate, and that's the US Senate. And most of those members of parliament had no idea what some of these technologies. They were saying, you know, that AI that does this, you know, but if, imagine if such an interview was ha happening in the Kenyan parliament, it would again be more or less the same drama. So again, this is our responsibility as citizens, like apart from electing, I mean, we can kind of figure out how we can elect people who have an idea of what technology is. We need to also be shaping the laws that guide this technology, like every other technology. When we cars, imagine if we never came up with traffic laws, right? Where would we be right now? So when we came up with cars, it was a really technology, right? Ford and you know, mass production, amazing technology. But where would we be if we never came up with traffic laws? So in as much as we think of AI as this super nice technology, it needs the laws to govern it. And we need to be able to govern how this is done. Yes, uh, Albert, I, very quickly, we are just going to answer the last two. Yes, please. And uh, then, I'm getting late and I'm so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Somebody is saying for job market, how best to create our portfolios? And after you answer that, uh, I am going to give the person with the name Prudence Chef Quest to ask the last question and we'll call it a day. Uh, how can yes. we create our portfolio, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like, like I was mentioning, um, there's a competition called, there's a, there's a website called Kaggle, which is a competition for data scientists and um, it helps you build, um, you know, there's so many interesting problems you can solve on Kaggle. It gives you the data sets, gives you the idea and they're constantly updating and, 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 and creating new, um, new uh, challenges. So a lot of people build their portfolio from Kaggle competitions. You go there, you pick a competition that you want, you know a little bit of programming, uh, you put those two tools together and you build um, a product out of that. Uh, that kind of helps. That really helps. Uh, yeah, Kaggle, it's actually, how do you spell that? Somebody say I should share that. It should be K-A-G-G-L-E. 
it's a data science uh, um, website where there's so many projects from all over the world um, that people go and solve these challenges and kind of get um, rewards and you can have ranking and that kind of thing. So that's one way to do because there's so many things. You can do a challenge in Kaggle. Ah, there's also Zindi, which is purely African, by the way. Uh, uh, I forgot to talk about that. It's, 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 uh, it's another sort of like a data place that you can go do these challenges and share and, 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 uh, and be, use that to build your GitHub profile because that helps you significantly. If you can win a Kaggle competition, damn it, you're going to get a job. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You need to be pretty good to win a Kaggle competition and people compete over time and, and, and try to get there. AI Kenya has also some hackathons, yeah. This, um, probably not, I probably shouldn't say this, but I think I'm gonna say it. We might, I'm thinking of um, organizing a hackathon also in relation to AI. So kind of like a joint uh, pack between, you know, Barcelona's Park Computing Center, some of this agenda that we can do also. Sort of like, you know, get people knowing like what kind of problems can we solve with AI. But that's just somewhere in the air, it's still being worked on. I'm trying to get the resources from, from, from Barcelona and Japan and see if we can utilize that and see if we can, you know, do some cool work. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, last person, Prudence Chip Quaid. Prudence. Let's, let's give you the last chance before we continue. Uh, my question is, this is Paris through Prudence's account. My question is, uh, Albert, just help me demystify this question of uh, cryptocurrency. Is that the future that we are headed to? When you hear things going around, I don't know, Bitcoin, I don't know, all those kind of cryptocurrency. Is that something that we as Kenyans are lagging behind? And is it something that uh, we need? I'm, I'm talking in terms of an investor also. Yeah. And maybe the young people can also pick up if it's something they would love to go into. Well, um, so I'm not an expert on cryptocurrency, honestly. And uh, Paul, <laughs> my friend, when we were in uni, was the one who was trying to get me into this cryptocurrency thing. And he kept doing it. And he's still doing a lot of stuff about cryptocurrency. But here's what I want to say. Cryptocurrency is just a product of something called blockchain technology. And blockchain technology is the thing. Like, if there's one thing I can bet my life on, it's AI and blockchain technology. And when I was giving my talk, you realized that I mentioned that, um, that, that uh, the task force that was developed by the Kenyan government was um, at blockchain and AI technology. So I, I don't want to say anything about cryptocurrency because I don't work too much on that area, but I do know the, the scientific principles and the science principles behind blockchain technology. And just to give you an example of what that means is we can have a very secure source of information, a trusted source of information that is, first of all, incorruptible and that cannot be changed unless there's a unison in all the people. So what we can build from blockchain technology is not so... Cryptocurrency is one of the things we can build from blockchain technology. And the beauty of this is we don't need to involve the banks because right now your reference point for money is the US. And I don't remember which year, but US had a reference point of gold. But then they stopped doing that and now they're just printing money. So it is highly likely that the economy can and will collapse at some point. But if we were, for example, using blockchain, then it's impossible for such an economic collapse because what happens is that the, 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 it's not centralized, as we call it. And that's what makes blockchain technology such a very important technology. It's not centralized. But I don't want to go too much into that. I don't want to um, speculate because I'm not an expert in, in blockchain technology, in, in cryptocurrency. But I do know that blockchain technology, for example, we can use it to build the land system. One of the problems we have in Kenya is that, you know, you go buy a piece of land and the next thing you come, somebody has also bought us that same piece of land. But with blockchain technology, you cannot do that because every other person in that network needs to validate that. And that's just a very high level view of how things actually happen. Down below, they're way more complicated than that. But that's not my area of expertise. And, uh, but I do think that there's a future also in blockchain and that's something we should be on the lookout for, uh, whether now or in the future, but that's something we should definitely be on the lookout for. Anyways, guys. <laughs> thank you so yes. much, Albert. Uh, that was um, our last question. And uh, we thank you for sparing your time to give us such a wonderful educative uh, presentation appreciate it. AI is the future of technology as we can see and we thank you and for the services you've offered and we thank wish you all the best in your career. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that you'll come back and help us build this great nation.
Thank you so much on behalf of the Alumni Association. I salute you and I thank you so much. Please, maybe you can have your last words you want to say to us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be back at Light Academy. I kind of feel like I'm back in Light Academy. And really, in front of everyone else here, I really want to say that, and when I think about this, I kind of get emotional. I want to really thank the people like Light Academy who really shaped who I have become today. I'm talking about people like Mr. Tumer, uh, Mr. Kuchuk, Shakir, Dr. Gongor. I'm really incredibly grateful to these people because these people picked me up and showed me what I could become and enabled me to be that. And uh, for me, Light Academy is not just a school. It's, it's, it's family. It's, 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 a whole, it's where my life was kind of like constructed. And I'm really grateful to the people at Light Academy. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you very much to all my teachers uh, back in Light Academy. Um, all of them, really, all of them. Uh, thank you very much for you guys and, and how you helped me and how I got my scholarship to Turkey to study computer science. The opportunity to work in Light Academy as a computer technician between 2008 and 2010 really helped shape and create that love for computer science. And when I was going to uni, it was no doubt. I, 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 just, I knew that I was gonna be, um, I was gonna continue with this computer science path. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nasur, for reaching out to me. Uh, Nasur, we were together in Turkey. He was doing biotechnology and uh, or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but we were in different cities. He's the one who reached out to me. Thank you for inviting me, Nasur. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and yeah, Asante Sana. I kinda... uh, Albert, before you leave, just a minute. Your teacher, Mr. Uh, Mustafa, if you maybe want to say hi yes, to please, you. Please, Mr. I can give you one. Mr. Mustafa is there. He could maybe <laughs> say a little bit about what they're doing at Light Academy, and I don't know. <laughs> Mustafa, <laughs> you can say one or two to your student. I think he's hello. Yeah. Hello, Mustafa John. <laughs> How are you doing, Albert? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for giving your time and uh, dedicating yourself for, for such a nice presentation. I really felt proud while I, while I was watching. Uh, you know, when the time I was teaching you, I think in Form 2, I yeah. left uh, you at Form 2. Yeah. Then now I found out you in a very, um, form, in a very informative seminar yeah. here. Thank you very much for everything. Yeah, thank you so much. Diego. Hope you hope we will see you in higher levels of life in near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for everything. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a nice day and good luck. Thank you.